My name is Henry Sikalski. Uh, I teach here. Uh, I've been doing it uh, I, a little bit by accident for 20 years. So I feel like I gave it the office with regard to my support for this institution. But in addition, I run a nonprofit called the Nonproliferation Policy Education Center. And there was a two year project that the center undertook. Roughly, it was to try to put proper nouns on the question of what we're talking about when we say there are nuclear security problems. Many of you may remember that President Obama gave a speech in Prague in 2009. And one of the points that he made was that more needed to be done to secure nuclear materials that could be quickly diverted or used or seized by terrorists or non-state actors to make nuclear weapons. This then prompted a nuclear security summit in Washington. After they held it, it was pointed out that it wasn't going to be much of an initiative unless they had these meetings on a routine basis. So they then, two years later, held one in Seoul, Korea. By the way, with each one of these summits, there was a, an effort to get somebody to give up some of the highly rich uranium or separate plutonium that might be useful to make bombs to either send it back to places like Russia or the United States. Uh, and, and so the run-up to these summits was kind of interesting because you, you wait for the news of well, who's, who's going to cough up some material. Uh, the latest one, of course, happened this spring in the Netherlands. Now there is one more. Oh, really? I'm hold that. Chicago, I think. Right, because bring it to Chicago. President Obama's hometown. Okay, well, I don't know how that works. I, well, there's, there, yes, the Atomic Energy uh, Project mm, in the Met Lab at the University of Chicago. There actually is a connection uh, in Chicago. <coughs> what time of the year are they going to do it? I think spring. You better hope it's spring. It's a brutal, <laughs> brutal place to be holding anything in the winter. Anyway. It feel like winter. Well, very long. Well. I, went, I went to school there for eight years, believe me. It's a very sensitive to the season. Now, uh, you might well ask, well, uh, why are we holding this meeting? Now, first of all, uh, we did put out a book that dealt with the security of nuclear weapons. This was put out in July of uh, 2013, and you, you probably can get copies of plenty there. Of the, this was about nuclear weapons. What we're trying to do is actually put some history to what this problem might be and use some proper nouns other than the United States. It is. And so we talked about crises where nuclear weapons either were fired off in the case of China and the French, you know, the Algerian crisis, or nearly were fired off or seized in the case of Pakistan and Russia. And there's some interesting histories, interesting reading. But then it dawned on us that we need to do something more, and that is to talk not just about the weapons and securing them, but the materials. If you go to our website, which is npolicy.org, you'll notice that there is a book available electronically called Nuclear Materials Gone Missing. Is that, that's the title, right? Okay. And what you're going to get today is basically a, a scan of the key chapters and a, a little bit of commentary. Um, now, you may well ask, well, Jesus, they, they already had this security summit. What, what do we need to be doing this for? I mean, it's, it's over, isn't it? Well, luckily, uh, the summits are not very ambitious. Well, there he is. Hello. <laughs> so, really, do you want anything to eat? 
we want to hold it. It's more than all right. We can get some. Uh, forfeited my, my lunch break. No, you did not forfeit anything. <laughs> you can eat a little, and then you can talk. All right. What would you prefer? Let me just go back there and get sure. something. Okay. All right. Um, you're number three anyway. You've got a little time. So it turns out that these nuclear security summits do prompt nations to surrender some material, and that's a good thing. Actually, I, I think that's the best part of these summits. Um, but the communiques and what they talk about, not so much. Uh, actually, incredibly unimpressive. I, I recommend that you take a look at one of these documents. Uh, I did. It doesn't take long to read. What's stunning, and will lead us into the discussion today about material gone missing is the order of the determinations for the latest summer. The first and most important one, it turns out, is that we affirm our commitment to our shared goals. And one of those shared goals is non-proliferation. The other is peaceful uses of nuclear energy. And they immediately insist, as the first point, that measures to strengthen nuclear security, that's basically guarding with guns, gates, and guards, nuclear material, <coughs> nuclear weapons, so they don't get seized, that those measures will not hamper the rights of states to develop and use nuclear energy for peaceful purposes. That's the first point. The second point is that we should focus and strengthening nuclear security. <laughs> now, I mean, this is a bit underwhelming, because it more or less is telling you that nuclear security takes the back seat to promoting peace and nuclear energy. It's a very odd document. Um, then, uh, when we get to something that might be related to today's discussion, it's a little elliptical. Let me see if I can find it here. Uh, it's a little bare. Oh, here we go. Nuclear material. We recognize that highly enriched uranium, which is basically weapons grade uranium, and separated plutonium, which is what you use to make plutonium bombs, require special precautions. This is good. And that it is of great importance that they are perfectly secured, consolidated, and accounted for. Sounds, yeah. sounds about right. I'm glad after the third summit they clarified all that. Okay. What we're going to talk about doesn't fit this set of points. This is what I would describe as an optimist view of what the problem is. See, basically, the way they look at it, or I should say we look at it, it's a matter of simply putting security measures on material accounted for. Problem. There's a lot of material, it turns out, that's been produced that's gone missing, unaccounted for. They call this muff. I guess it, it kind of uh, rhymes with, it's reminiscent of the word goof or, you know, <coughs> Oops, or you know, muff, material unaccounted for. It turns out that what we're going to talk about today is specific cases that are quite interesting. And I, I thought the way we would sort of go is through the chapters. And I thought what we'd do is we'd start off with the worst news first, and then we'd go to the stories that are a little less horrible than the first story. Uh, and then a little better, and then we'll end on a somewhat upbeat note in the end. So we're going to talk first about a very fundamental problem that goes even beyond muff, which is, what if you discovered that material was missing? What is the record about doing anything about it? Turns out, we'll learn, not such a good good story for it there. 
Then I thought we'd turn to Charles Ferguson, who runs the Federation of American Scientists. Uh, he wrote a chapter on some bookkeeping problems to the tune of about something over five tons of weapons use of material that went on in California. But keep in mind, MUF generally refers technically to uh, an amount of material that you can't account for after you've allowed for certain margins of inherent error. So what might really be missing is much bigger than the buff figure. Okay. Um, it's what's known as a very conservative estimate of what you don't know. Uh, so five tons, I don't know. Uh, let's divide some of that's hue, some of that's pew. Uh, Roughly half and half. Let's say, let's, let's be generous, 20 into to five mm -hmm. tons. Right. What is that? 20 yeah. kilograms into five tons. You're, you're the mathematician. Is it? Oh, yeah. Here's a uh, pen. Sure. Yeah. Well, 5,000 kilograms, and then divide that. Uh, 20 is like? 250, right? So yeah. 250 times five, what is that? Is that it? Oh, no, I made it now. Sorry. No, no. You're not the mathematician. <laughs> You're the mathematician. <laughs> All right, 20 kilograms into 5,000 5, kilos, which is five tons, right? Yeah. Okay. Right, yeah. All right, so that's. No, that's it. No, 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 no. This is wrong. How many <laughs> this, this, this is embarrassing trying to do math in our head. Right? It's several thousand, isn't it? Well, this is at, so this is the way I, I do it, Henry. So roughly there are about thousand thousand weapons if you if you use twenty. Code. Yeah, because uh, roughly half of that is, is plutonium. Okay. So you're talking about twenty five hundred uh, kilos of plutonium, and if it's you know four of the six. Oh, it's twenty five hundred. Yeah, PU. Just PU. Okay, let's yeah. get this. Now the, the number is worth knowing. Look, divide it by six. That's pretty conservative. Six. How about four? That's the deal we Sure, have. okay. That's what uh, Tom Cochran and Chris Payne would say. Four. Sure. Four. Sure. Four. Let's go four. Right. Four into 2,500 is... Six. So, yeah, about roughly 600 bombs worth of plutonium. And so the rest... And, and, and yeah. the, the Highlander Uranium, probably a, a couple hundred, right? Two, three hundred, right? So almost... I would say roughly a thousand weapons. Yeah, just under a thousand. We don't know what it is. I don't know. That sounds like a pretty interesting number. And then the not, so that's kind of bad actually. It, but a little bit better, although kind of shaky, is the amount of civilian material that's been produced that we don't know where it went. Ed Lyman from the Union of Concerned Scientists who does their nuclear work did a chapter and it was uh, worked on. We'll hear some comment on that from uh, Ryan Snyder. And then we'll end on the upbeat note about South Africa, where they claim they surrendered everything. It, the only problem is we're not sure they did. And this, this gives some idea of what the problems might be of trying to deal with countries that want to work with you, you know, whether you really know whether you've got all the, the goods. So why don't I start? Uh, there was a chapter. I'm, Roughly uh, bringing up a chapter that was done by Victor Galinsky in the book. And the title of his chapter uh, is somewhat telling. Sometimes major violations of nuclear security get ignored. What's he talking about? Well, a couple of cases. Uh, one of the most interesting that he spent the most time, he used to serve on the Nuclear Regulatory Commission during the Ford, Carter, and Reagan administrations. And one of the cases he took up was uh, famously referred to as the Apollo or Numec case. And this facility in Pennsylvania uh, worked with uh, cleaning up and conditioning uh, naval reactor fuel, which happened to be weapons grade uranium. And they had a little problem uh, they couldn't account for, after they made enormous, generous allowances for statistical errors, 
for at least 100 kilograms or more, at the least. Turns out it's probably closer to 300 kilograms or something. Well, where did it go? Uh, the argument was made, oh, well, you know, something like mistakes were made in passive voice. Uh, it's somewhere in the middle, we think. And it turns out that the owner was a one Mr. Shapiro, and he had extremely close relations with the Israeli nuclear weapons establishment and the Mossad. And they were going in and out of this facility on a routine basis. Pretty certain now it ended up in Israel. All of them. Now, uh, there's been some declassification uh, of some documents that are pretty incriminating for the personalities involved in the Carter administration who more or less said, I know the CIA has said that the Israelis have it, but let's not make that the, the story. Mm -hmm. Let's go with the arguments of the Department of Energy that, you know, no, it's not clear what happened, you know. And it was kind of put aside. Um, there also are other cases that are interesting where we had commitments from the Pakistanis not to enrich to a certain level, and we kind of lost our taste for enforcing that because, well, they became very important during the war we were waging against the Soviet Union in Afghanistan. And it took a very, very long time for the intelligence about what they were doing in violation of their agreements not to make this material to get the U.S. government to say, well, I guess they violated the laws that we can understand as we can. There are other cases like this, and the point here is something akin to the following. Uh, a friend of mine who was very senior in the Ford administration once asked a very senior inspector at the International Atomic Energy Agency what they would do if they, perchance, opened the door to a room and saw a nuclear weapon. And <clears throat> The first response of this person who was an inspector, and a, re a respected one, was if I had any idea that the bomb was in that door, behind that door, I would not open the door because if I did, I, I'd be killed. And if I did open the door and saw it, I'd close the door and not say anything. I think what we need to keep in mind when we talk about nuclear security, therefore, is it's not quite enough to even account for everything. It's not quite enough even to know what things are missing. And it's not quite enough to guard what you can account for. You have to be willing to sound an alarm when something's gone missing. The track record in this regard is I don't know, what are batting averages when you don't do very well? Like zero? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> very low. Maybe batting 100 is pretty miserable, but yeah. I'd right. say it's below 100. Okay. I mean, if there was negative territory, maybe we would discover where we are. And the point, therefore, is if you're going to talk about nuclear security, you've got to ask the question, for what purpose would you secure the materials if you are not interested in doing something if some of it goes missing or isn't secured? That part, I don't think, gets discussed at least since. Because it's very unsettling, both historically and politically. Um, and it's, it's sort of the bottom beneath the next story, which is, but there has been material that's gone missing, and we did know about it. It wasn't much that we did about it. It wasn't just the Israeli case. There's the American case. And the American case is quite a knee slapper um, chart. Thank you, uh, Henry. That's, you're great for teeing all this up. And it was. <coughs>
very interesting experience being part of this project. It's, it is pretty challenging. But on the plus side, you know, looking at the U.S. military sector, at least we have some uh, government reports that came out, uh, coming out of the Openness Initiative, going back to when Hazel O'Leary was Secretary of Energy under uh, President Clinton. And those reports on HU, highly enriched uranium production, plutonium production, at least give us a basis of how much fissile material was produced and at least how much material is unaccounted for according to the U.S. government. And as Henry said, it's a lot of material unaccounted for. And just to give you a little more details to that, if you look at HEU, it's about 3.2 metric tons, and plutonium, it's about 2.4, 2.5. So actually, it's quite a bit above five tons gone missing. It's almost getting close to six. And you might ask, well, well come on, Charles and Henry. Uh, the U.S. produced a lot of fissile material. Uh, go back to the Cold War. We were in an arms race with the Soviet Union. We produced tens of thousands of nuclear weapons. So on a percentage basis, it's still significant. If you, if you look at the amount of HU total that was produced, it's around 620 metric tons. So in terms of the, the, the uh, percentage difference, what's not accounted for, we're talking about about 0.5 percent. It may not seem like a lot percentage-wise when it comes to actual material, as you know, Henry and I stumbled through the math, it's a lot of weapons material. It's at least a few hundred on the uh, uranium side. And on the plutonium side, it's actually worse because the United States produced somewhat less than 100 metric tons of plutonium. And uh, of that, like I said, about 2.5 it's gone missing. So we're talking about 2.5% roughly of the plutonium produced is unaccounted for. A significant fraction of that material uh, was you know, missing, quote unquote, missing in the Rocky Flats plant in Colorado. That place was a huge mess. They've had fires. Uh, one of our colleagues, Tom Cochran, at uh, Natural Resource Defense Council in the 1990s wrote a series of reports looking at Rocky Flats, and I drew pretty heavily on Tom's analysis of the plutonium side, which is very helpful. So we do have also in this country independent scientists like Dr. Cochran, who's done that investigation. That's important to keep in mind. Well, you know, getting back to the standard story. Standard story is, well, well come on, you know, um, this stuff is in waste streams or stuck in piping what are called normal operating losses. You keep seeing that phrase again and again when you look at these government reports. And they also sweep stuff figuratively under the rug when they talk about clerical errors. That's another source of, well, we don't know where this stuff is. Blame it on these, these accountants, these clerks. You know, they made some errors. Mistakes were made. Uh, we didn't have good accounting systems until sometime in the 1970s. But another important point in my paper is, even after the 1970s, the GAO, the Government Accountability Office, and the Inspector General's Office for DOE, Department of Energy, they kept repeatedly sounding an alarm that the accounting system, the new accounting system that we have, is still not good enough. It doesn't meet our stringent standards. And it doesn't really provide, and this is a very important point, it doesn't really provide timely warning. This is a huge concept in this whole field. Because uh, if you don't discover that something's missing months or even years in the cases that Henry mentioned, uh, then you, you, have, you have no way of intervening. You have no way of stopping, uh, whether it's a terrorist group or a nation state, from taking that material that has been potentially diverted and making it into nuclear explosives. And that NUMEC case that Henry refers to Almost 12 years went by, by the time when the Atomic Energy Commission discovered in 1965 that there was evidence of an alleged significant diversion until 1977, when uh, John Dingell in Congress finally asked the GAO to do an extensive study on this. 12 years. Well, there, there were certain internal things, yeah. but what's interesting, when you're supposed to keep the the horse in the barn and it turns out the horse left and you know it's very embarrassing 
the first instinct is not to admit anything left the barn. And so the longer the trail goes cold, the greater the incentive is to cover it up. Right, and, and you, you see that. And, it, and these reports are publicly available. You can just dig around a little bit on the internet. You can find these things. And I also have references in my paper. Um, so let me just also point out, um, just one more point here. If you look at the HEU that's missing, like I said, about 3.2 metric tons. And the worst case from this New Mech uh, incident that Henry referred to, where up to 300 kilograms could have been diverted, that's 0.3 tons. So we're talking about 10% of the material we can't account for at HEU was likely from that one major incident from that facility in Apollo, Pennsylvania. And yeah, so uh, when you look at the DOE's report from the 1996, from the openness initiative, they, they don't really mention this new MEC case, of course, but uh, they say one half of the material unaccounted for is from Department of Energy sites. Uh, the other half is from commercial sites. And this Apollo, Pennsylvania, new MEC facility was a commercial site, but as Henry mentioned, it was using naval fuel weapons grade material, and it was a military uh, type of use. So that's why it's included in, in my chapter. So um, let, me, let me stop there. Hopefully that's enough, uh, gives you enough taste of uh, what we saw in the U.S. military side. It's pretty good. Now, this gets to the next presentation. We're going to transition from the military to the civil side. Now, you may all be aware from reading the newspapers that this week, the major nuclear weapon states plus Germany are sitting down with Iran. What are they talking about? Oh, how you can continue to make nuclear fuel by enriching uranium, and we can account for it. <coughs> OK. Uh, that's a neat trick. What's been the track record of our ability to keep track of civilian nuclear fuel making activities. Now, I don't know whether uh, any of you uh, have an idea of what's involved when you make nuclear fuel, but uh, we tend to think of nuclear fuel after it's made, and it, it's, it's uh, a massive multi-ton uh, assembly that's encased in metal, and uh, you can put tags on it, and it's kind of the functional equivalent of a large ice cube. <laughs> but what we're talking about when we're making nuclear fuel isn't an ice cube. We're talking about a lot of powders, solutions, and gases. By the way, it's very hard to tag solutions, or powders, gas. or gases. <laughs> yeah. And as a result, when we talk about this, we kind of forget that it might be statistically difficult to keep track of. Now, Ed Lyman used to run a, a place called the Nuclear Control Institute, and they were very good about hammering away at this point. So that's the reason I asked him to do the original chapter and why I'm going to turn to him to talk about what history has to say about this problem. <clears throat> All right. Thanks, Henry. And um, while the book does have some historical examples, it's always important to study history to figure out how to learn lessons from it. And the problem is, in this particular area, there seems to be a willful desire not to learn the obvious lessons from what has gone on in the past. So there, are, when you process fizzle material in a bulk handling facility like a fuel fabrication plant, if you're working with a direct use material like plutonium, uh, and I'd like to distinguish that from the activities that are going on in Iran, where ostensibly what they're processing is not a direct use material, um, and would require, even if it were diverted, you would need to have some clandestine way to process it further. So I don't want to downplay the issues in Iran because they have plenty of centrifuge capacity they could they could utilize if they wanted to. But the bigger threat, the immediate threat as a result of accounting issues is direct use material 
in particular plutonium. Because a large reprocessing, spent fuel reprocessing plant, like the one the Japanese are uh, decided to start up at Bokasha, would separate about eight metric tons of plutonium a year. And that is on the order of 1,000 to 2,000 nuclear weapons worth of material. But the physical capability to actually safeguard and account for material is it, it's simply technically impossible to run that facility in an, on an industrial scale without disrupting operations and actually be able to to reduce your uncertainties to below uh, you know, 10 or 20 nuclear weapons worth of plutonium, much less one a year, right, per year. The Atomic Energy Agency, its policy on the books is that it's supposed to be able to detect the diversion of one significant quantity of plutonium, that's eight kilograms, uh, that it should be able to detect the diversion of you know, that entire quantity, which they call an abrupt diversion, within one month, or over the course of one year, uh, in what's called a protracted diversion, they should be able to detect it. But the state of the art at facilities like Rikasho, um, you simply cannot, they don't have the capability to detect with, the, with reasonable statistical parameters that, uh, let's say, um, 20 times that amount, or on the order of uh, you know, 200 kilograms or more, could be diverted or uh, stolen without detection. And the problem lies in the issue that if you have a plant with so many miles of process piping of glove boxes, which cannot be physically accessed in, in a reasonable period of time, that when you put powders and liquids through these, these this equipment, they will cake onto process equipment, they'll get stuck in, in corners, and the only way to actually physically account for that material accurately is to shut down the plant, to go in, to scrape it off the walls, uh, to try to get everything you can off the process equipment. This is what Japan experienced um, in the late 1990s, well, early 1990s, when they tried to operate a fuel fabrication plant called the Plutonium Fuel Production Facility, or PFPF. They started to generate larger amounts of scrap than they anticipated, and they found that this, this thing called holdup, that's the euphemism for plutonium that's getting stuck in the piping so you lose, so it doesn't come out the other end. Uh, that accumulated to about 70 kilograms over the course of the first couple of years of operation. And this was an issue within the International Atomic Energy Agency because their ability to make their finding that, that less that no more than eight kilograms of material had been diverted. They had confidence in the safeguards on that facility. They could not make that finding with such a large amount of material unaccounted for. But unwilling to make waves at that time, they tried to resolve it internally with Japan, got nowhere. So it wasn't until some, someone leaked this information, it became public, that it forced Japan to actually respond to this issue. They had to shut down the plant. They had to cut apart the glove boxes. They had to spend two years and $100 million and were scraping all that plutonium out. And they still were left with about 10 kilograms unaccounted for. So the, the idea that you could actually, if there were an actual diversion of this material, that you could respond to that uh, loss in a timely way is, is absolute fiction. And this problem is fundamental to any bulk handling facility. Now, here in the United States today, there's a debate over a facility also for making plutonium fuel called the Mixed Oxide Fuel Fabrication Facility at the Savannah River site. And I've spent 10 years um, analyzing and challenging the material accounting and security programs for that plant. And the again, the lesson this obvious lesson that you would want to take every uh, step imaginable to make sure that if plutonium were diverted, that you'd be able to detect that before an adversary could do something with it. But that lesson is not sinking in 
to the uh, National Nuclear Security Administration, which is the project's sponsor, the contractor, which is called Mock Services, or the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, which is allegedly analyzing the, the plan to, to license. Now, one of the biggest issues that it's a slightly different issue from what we've talked about already, is what happens if someone alleges a theft has occurred? That could be as bad as a theft itself if you can't prove that it hasn't happened. And one of the requirements the Nuclear Regulatory Commission has for a facility like the MOX plant is that you should be able to resolve an alleged theft in, in a timely manner. That's essentially what they say. So you would say that would probably be within a matter of hours or days at the most. Because what happens if uh, someone gets a phone call that we've stolen a bomb's worth of plutonium from that plant and we're going to destroy New York City if you don't meet our demands within 24 hours. So the NSA would call up the Savannah River site, ask them if they could disprove this, or you know, confirm or disprove this theft within 24 hours. And I tell you the answer is no. And if you ask the same question one week, it would probably still be no. Maybe even a month. They still wouldn't be able to tell you if that amount of material was stolen. And that's because the way the plant was designed makes it essentially impossible to physically inventory material in certain parts of the plant. I'm not even talking about powders that are stuck in pipes. I'm talking about plutonium in cans in the storage area because the storage area was modeled after a French plant called Maylox. And the French don't have requirements like the US does. So they didn't worry about the issue of what if you needed to find out what was the contents of that can that's buried four deep all the way in the back of this vault. Um, they didn't worry about having to retrieve that in a, in a rapid period of time. But we do. And that plant, because of the way the vault was constructed, um, it would take many days or weeks to actually look inside the can. So what is the solution on the part of the uh, license, the applicant for this plan, is that we're going to have a, a, um, an automatic accounting system based on uh, computer inventory systems. And that's going to be infallible. So all we have to do is check the data in the computers. And if that tells us there's no problem, then you don't have to worry. Now, what if I told you that there's no cybersecurity requirement on the part of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission for the performance of those systems and their protection against cyber threats, but they're working on it. Uh, but because the way the NRC works, if they don't have a rule in place, you don't have to meet that rule. So they're basically saying that the system, which uh, does not have to meet an NRC cybersecurity standard, is secure enough that you just have to trust the data that's in the system tell you whether or not a theft is uh, taking place. What if your adversary was in the IT department and, and compromised the data? Well, we have protection against it. So that's the answer. And right now that plan is um, on uh, shaky ground. The Department of Energy finally seems to want to pull the plug on it, but uh, Congress or some people in Congress are continuing to push it, so it could still happen. And the worst part of it is the implications for Russia, because this plan was being built as part of a bilateral program with Russia. Russia is fabricating plutonium fuel for a fast reactor uh, right now. Uh, there are no international or bilateral controls over what Russia is doing. And I find it hard to believe that their ability to account for the material in their fabrication plant is any better than ours. Um, and certainly, if we're not uh, setting the standard here that we think is reasonable, then there's absolutely no reason to believe the Russians would be doing it on their own. And so, this is the type of um, threat that we're facing today. So, we'll stop there. Well, presumably, uh, the Japanese have figured all this out better than we have, right? <coughs> yeah, just like they figured out how to run their boiling water reactors safely. Right. So, I mean, the point here is that this is not to pick on the United States so much as it is a baked in the cake problem for any country that's engaging in the commercial production of large amounts of nuclear fuel 
and, and, and to right. emphasize, this is a model, the, the French plan was a model. Right. So this is sort of the representing the state of the art of, of internationally. So the, the French, uh, just to clarify, are building the plant that we are working with with regard to plutonium fuel fabrication. They're building it also for Japan. Well, they have, roughly. It's their design. Uh, who else are they going to build it for? Oh, the Chinese. You see a pattern here. The point here is that all of these activities are going to go forward. Uh, by the way, as a result of a major, major, significant study for many years, uh, someone who was very renowned came to the conclusion that we have to worry probably about inside the place. Yeah. Sounds right. They've got, to, they've got to take care of it. The problem is, would you know if something had been stolen? If the noise level is plus or minus uh, 200 kilograms, if someone said, well, I think someone stole 10, would you be able to know since your margin of error is about 200? Welcome to your new exciting Okay, I think it might make sense to have Ryan, who uh, says Federation of American Scientists, but we know you're out and about um, looking. It's been a while since I've been with Charles. Yes. Yeah. yeah. But he actually is a physicist. I am. For what that's worth. For what that's worth. But if you listen to what he has to say, it's kind of interesting. So let's listen. Um, yeah, thank you, Henry, for yes. um, inviting me. Um, when, when Henry asked me to do this, um, I, I didn't know anything about IEA safeguards. And my, my academic field is actually in particle physics, which is actually a field which is primarily based in statistics about how well you can actually know what it is that you're measuring. And so when Henry asked me to do this review, I wanted to see how does the IEA actually know if there is any material missing from a facility. And I just went to their website and downloaded their handbook on all of these various instruments that they use, and there's one page where they have all of the measurement uncertainties for all of these instruments that they use at all of these facilities. And so, when you're actually doing an analysis to figure out which kind of instruments may let you know with a certain amount of confidence what, what material may be missing, you don't need to know anything about physics to do that. It's just a measurement uncertainty, which is actually, usually like in a reprocessing plant, it's about 1% of the total plant throughput is, is your measurement uncertainty. So 1% times whatever the plant throughput is, that's actually um, plus or minus that amount. You can't really know whether or not that amount is actually missing. For um, about 90 to 95% confidence level, you multiply it by about 3.3. .3. So you're just multiplying three numbers together, which is the total plant throughput, the measurement uncertainty, and 3.3 .3 to get to 90 to 95%. You don't have to know anything about physics or science to do this. So my first question when I looked at all of these numbers was whether or not they're actually real. Because my, um, because my experience as a physicist, there is a, there's a certain sociology to science that many people are not aware of, but it's actually a human story. And I could sit here for hours and hours and talk about the history of physics and how there were certain measurements made when people were actually not believing what certain scientists were doing for lots of different reasons, whether it was the advancement of their career, or they simply just made a mistake. And so that was my first question, was looking at all these numbers on a page, which is, how do I know that this is actually real? And I have, I have no idea of actually knowing that without digging much deeper into the technology. So that was actually my, my first question. I, I have no idea of knowing that. Because um, otherwise, it's just multiplying numbers together, and you don't have to be a physicist to try and figure out whether or not what they claim they know, they can actually know. So that, that's actually the first point. Um, the other point is, in the Tokai example in Japan, that was about 206 kilograms of plutonium missing between 1977 and 2003, um, which divided by about four or five is you know, 40 or uh, 50 weapons of um, bomb material. One question I have is, if you make a measurement every, say, every month or every two months, do, do subsequent measurements, do you have any kind of institutional memory about the previous measurement that you made so that there's actually small protracted diversions over perhaps months or years you could actually conclude that there actually has been a significant quantity of bomb material that's missing. 
you might be able to detect an abrupt diversion of a significant quantity of bomb material, but can you actually do it if there's actually smaller um, protracted diversions over you know, multiple months or even years? And the Tokai example was between 1977 and 2003. So um, that's, that's another question, which is how are these measurements layered after years and years and years? Um, the, uh, so those are just some of the, the technical details. The, the human limitations, I think, are sometimes more interesting because I have questions about how well trained does your workforce have to be to use some of this equipment? Does the measurement uncertainty actually go up if you have a, a less well trained workforce? I don't know the answer to that question. Um, the, the interesting, another interesting point is in the Thorpe case, which is a uh, reprocessing plant in England, in 2005 they found 22 tons of uranium and 160 kilograms of plutonium missing. And if you read the report that the, uh, that the government produced on that, it was essentially the same thing as a check engine light going off in a car. It was, there was a low level alarm that had been on for multiple months before the leak had actually started at this plant. And so this alarm is actually still on when the leak starts. And so no one has any clue that there's been any, been any particular problem. Um, I think that might have implications for cybersecurity in the future where you might be able to actually purposely try and create a, a problem and see if the operators at the plant actually notice that there is a problem and wait a particular set of, of months before actually attempting a diversion. That's just one particular possibility. Um, I can remember myself just being a graduate student looking at computer monitors and screens and sometimes alarms would go off but nothing would actually happen so I would just assume that nothing was actually wrong. And that's actually what I believe happened at this, at this store plant and that's consistent with what the uh, the UK government produced in this in this document. Um, so the point is that these limitations and these technical numbers, that in my view is the most ideal case and that's the best that you can possibly expect to do. And there are other limitations that will just simply add to what are already significant limitations that you have. And so that was my, my main takeaway from, from from what I did for for, for this volume. By the way, it, in the 1950s, they held a series of hearings on Capitol Hill, which led to the creation of the Arms Control and Disarmament Agency. They were called the Humphrey Hearings. Senator Humphrey uh, was very keen on creating an Arms Control and Disarmament Agency. And they had a, 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 a Dr. English, I think his name was, and he testified on what the margins of errors would be on safeguard. Now, a lot of people stinker at these estimates. But if I hear you correctly, they may be still pretty good. He said 10% of the bulk handling facilities. He said, well, you, you might not know where 10% was. And for even light water reactor spent fuel, it was, I think, I don't know, 3 or 4%. I mean, that would be difficult. Uh, now, uh, in those days, we had the quaint notion that it didn't matter if someone diverted 20 or 30 bombs worth. And the reason why is we had this uh, almost uh, 1940s idea that unless someone could destroy every one of uh, uh, Rosie Riveter's uh, aircraft factories, which would mean they have to destroy 100 cities, well, we could always win the war eventually with Rosie get her out again, <laughs> put the airplanes together, and we bomb them into oblivion over five years, which was Second World War. Uh, it was quaint because it was mistaken. Actually, we now know that you know a bomb going off could be a really bad thing and precipitate a major war between two other nuclear weapon states, and one or two is bad, and 20 is certainly very bad. But it shaped what was the safeguard system. The toleration initially was quite large because that wasn't considered to be a vital major nuclear threat. Now, rather than to totally depress you, we thought we would end on a somewhat upbeat note. Um, how shall I put it? The jury's still out on this one. But this one at least begins with a, with a happy ending. It has to do with South Africa. Now, one of the things that's become quite popular in the last decade is talking about 
uh, the ideal number that everyone can agree on if, when you talk about nuclear weapons. There's only one number that everyone can agree on. It would be nice if it was zero. Yeah. How you get there, whether you can, and all of that, that's in dispute. But you know, if you if you have a big imagination, you can at least get this mural somewhere, and you say, "Well, that would be neat." By the way, whenever this comes up, I always say yes. But can we also get rid of video displays while we're at it? You know, in other words, why limit it to just nuclear energy? There are lots of things I'd like to get rid of. Good luck. Uh, anyway, the notion here is we would like to reduce and eliminate in various places. We did in the case of South Africa. How well do we hold the brief on what was dispensed with? You want to know, because if you don't do too well at that, it doesn't augur well for getting confidence you can do it well there or anywhere else. And so it's a happy ending. How good was the run-up? And what do we know about the, uh, if you look at the post-ending uh, 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 story? Okay. Well, thank you, Hank. Jody. Saving the best for last. Right. Well, I should, I should start with a disclaimer, which is certainly um, the work that I did on the South African nuclear weapons case by no means uh, takes away from the fact that the government did, in fact, dismantle or acknowledge uh, their nuclear weapons program and committed to uh, its status as a non-nuclear weapons state uh, and has continued to do so ever since, to our knowledge. Um, I would also add this interesting piece that I just discovered in the Voice of America from about a month and a half ago. South Africa leads the continent in nuclear development. So obviously you can get rid of the weapons, but you can't always get rid of the weapons infrastructure or the know-how. So obviously um, South Africa continues to operate two units at the Kuber plant uh, under safeguards and is now being seen as sort of a standard bearer in non-proliferation. Uh, they are also being uh, held up as a country that can uh, provide a lot of guidance to some of the countries in the region as they consider uh, building civilian nuclear power plant industries. So in that regard, Sa uh, South Africa does continue to stand out. Now, um, let's consider the case in the context of what was going on at the time in the world. Um, 1991 and 1993 are the two key dates that we need to think about. So in 1991, the uh, US government, the IAEA, the world community, convinced uh, the apartheid government to join the IAEA and to sign a, a safeguards uh, agreement as a non-nuclear weapons state. Uh, at that time, obviously, there was a lot going on in South Africa. Uh, the demise of the apartheid government was, was coming and the, uh, the white minority government saw that happening. Uh, I won't talk about what the impetuses were for getting rid of the program. They, I'm sure, were many, including geopolitics, but also possibly the potential change in government. Regardless of the reasons, uh, in 1991, the government uh, decided to get rid of the program. And so the president at the time basically asked the nuclear weapons establishment to begin to drop a plan to dismantle the facilities they had built to produce highly enriched uranium and to dispose of the six gun-type nuclear weapons that it had produced during the course of their 30-odd year program. Um, so all of that was good. Uh, on top of that, there was a, a demand to destroy most, if not all, of the documentation associated with the program. Now, on the one hand, that's good because you don't want that information getting out. But on the other hand, um, how does one account for what had been done in the past? Okay? The South African government obviously knew that at some point have, had this disclosure been made, or if this disclosure of, yes, we had nuclear weapons, is made, then they would have to evince themselves of the IAEA and show how much had been produced, how much material had been produced, and where it had gone to. Now that's important not only for safeguards purposes, but also because of public confidence. You need to establish the public confidence that in fact the program is gone and it's no longer a threat in the region or in the world. Well, because the government had had these facilities dismantled, the weapons dismantled, the material downblended in essence, and the documentation destroyed, 
one can imagine the challenges in trying to verify what had happened in the past. So, in 1991, when the South African apartheid government agreed to uh, sign this uh, IAEA safeguards agreement, the IAEA sent in a team to verify their, um, uh, their uh, statements about what materials they had, their quantities of material. And this was specifically highly enriched uranium. Uh, South Africa had em embarked upon a plutonium production uh, program briefly, but decided that because of the vast uh, uranium materials and uranium ore in the country, that it would be easier to do a, an HEU program. So that's what they did. So we're talking mainly about highly enriched uranium. So this was underway in 1991. Now the other thing, of course, that was happening in 1991 was the US invasion of Iraq. So clearly on the world stage, there was something pretty big happening out there. And of course, the discovery that Saddam Hussein had in fact begun to build a nuclear weapons program, I think really overtook a lot of the headlines and the IAEA was left to scramble for how this happened under their watch. So, so that was also happening at this time. Um, so I would argue that the global community may have been maybe a little more focused on what was happening in Iraq as opposed to what was happening in South Africa with the nuclear weapons program, at least from a headlines perspective. And in doing that research, I think I found that to be the case. Um, 1993 rolls around, and a new president comes in a couple of years before that, both, uh, de Klerk. And he was the one who made this decision to get rid of the program. Well, in 1993, he made a speech to Parliament and, in fact, admitted to the world that South Africa had, in fact, developed a nuclear weapons program with a limited nuclear deterrent of six gun type nuclear, actually, six and a half gun type nuclear weapons, each with 55 kgs of HEU. Well, for a lot of folks, particularly those in the US intelligence community, this was sort of affirmation of something that they had suspected. But for most of the world, it came as a bit of a shock. Wow, how did this happen? Uh, the South African government was very good at hiding uh, what they were doing. So now, uh, at the time, this is an interesting data point, at the time that this announcement was made by de Klerk, there was in fact an IAEA inspection team on the ground, physically on the ground. So um, imagine if you're an IAEA inspector and you're doing, going about your business and you're looking at these facilities and, going along assuming that yes, they've, they've shown us everything they need to show us and, and everything is good. And you get up the next morning and discover, oh no, wait, in fact, they've been lying. They've been blatantly lying to our faces. Um, and that's really what happened. So you've got these folks who've basically said, yes, no, this is, this is all there is to see. And then the next day say, actually, no, there, there's more there. So I'm, I'm being a little bit facetious, but the point is if I were an IAEA inspector, I'd be pretty suspicious of what was going on on the ground. But this is what the IAEA faced. So in the ensuing years, uh, obviously the IAEA uh, augmented their team with weapons inspectors, because the team was a little different before, and they went looking. Okay, how do we verify that in fact the government has, as it has said, lying to us before, but telling us the truth now, right? That it's dismantled its nuclear weapons arsenal, that everything is good, and they are now a non-nuclear weapons state and do this without any real documentation. So there are some public accounts of what the inspectors had gone through. And uh, one other data point is that there was a lot of de depleted uranium stored in about 600 very large drums. Well, the South African uh, weapons establishment, nuclear establishment, never accounted for the tails material that were in these drums. 600 drums, that's a lot of material. So not only did they have to reconstruct what had happened with facilities that no longer existed and without documentation, but now they had to figure out how much material was in these drums. A big challenge. In the end, around about 1995-96, the IAEA reported to its member states that yes, they had ultimately resolved a lot of these discrepancies. However... By the way, 95, that, that rings in my ears. Mm. That was a special year, wasn't it? Yes. Does anybody know what happened in 1995? We made the NPT, the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, indefinite. indefinite in its duration. Up until then, it was supposed to expire every 25 years. 
there was a tremendous incentive to clean this up and make it look good for 1995, I bet. I don't know if that's yeah, what you think. Additional protocols is coming up. Wow. Right. And it's, so that's, yeah, that's not as important as Not as important. No. Well, yeah. but that was going on at the same time as 93 yeah. plus 2 process, and yes, in, in 1995, the, um, the indefinite extension of the MBT. So I would also offer that in addition to the logistic challenge of dealing with what South Africa had actually done, um, despite the proclamation that the new government was kind of throwing the doors open, that there was no secrecy, that they had nothing to hide with regard to this program, there was, in fact, a number of secrecy laws in place. And the South African government at that time, around about 95, 96 or so, said that it did not want to disclose to the public the amount of highly enriched, enriched uranium it had produced because of concerns over proliferation or non-proliferation. So there, in fact, have never been public accounts of how much material was actually produced. Mm. The only estimate that I have been able to find was from Tom Cochran, who estimated, mm. based on the theoretical size of the facility and the amount of material uh, that the IAEA came up with, was 731 plus or minus 24 kilograms of 90% HEU. That is equivalent to roughly 12 Hiroshima or gun-type fission bombs. So, if we know that South Africa produced, in fact, six gun-type weapons, what happened to the other six weapons amounts? Because each weapon had 55 kg. So where did that come from? I don't know. I don't know. Now, on top of that, anybody who's dealt with the IAEA knows that when these inspections are done, the reports are kept safeguards confidential. They are not released to the public unless the host country agrees to do so. In the case of South Africa, the report has never been made public. Mm. From, from a public confidence standpoint, again, I would kind of question that move. If I were in a, you know, the ANC government seat, for example, I would want to say, here it is. Here's what we got. Here's what we did. Let's start over. Stay slaves clean. We have a new government in place now, all is well. And in fact, the South African government has led, has been a leader in the region in terms of non-proliferation efforts. But this is kind of still out there. And I would actually argue that had this case come to pass post 9-11, and now with the Obama administration's press to get to zero, I would be a little bit concerned about a possible bomb in the basement. Maybe. I got an alternative paranoid view. <laughs> I, mean, I know, I'm being a little paranoid here, but, but no, it's no, a question. No, 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 more paranoid. Oh, yeah. even paranoid more? Oh, oh, okay. Right. Like imagination. I've been meaning to talk to you about I was in South Africa in 91. I think it was 91 or 90, 92. And it was the first meeting. Of course, we were talking about nuclear capable rockets. But where they get the nuclear capable rockets? Oh, Israel. There's a book I recommend. It's by Sasha Polanski. What was it? Oh, uh, right. Yeah. Sasha uh, Plan Polanski. 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 Something yeah, something like that. Yeah. yeah. It's right. about the relationship between Israel and South Africa. I say this even though I've got a lot of trees planted in my name that have been cut down and burned in Israel. You know, if, if you go to a temple, you, you buy a tree. A lot of trees. But that's, if you really want to get crazy, maybe why they don't want to talk about this. Where did the, the stuff go? Could include some pretty exciting novels. Yeah. Although South Africa also has had historically a long relationship with Iran. Oh, wow. So, oh, no, you do? Okay, you get extra credit now. <laughs> <laughs> that's a whole other story. Well, in any event. Um, also, Libya. Oh, yes. So a couple of additional data points just to sort of keep in mind here. Um, number one, when, this, when the nuclear weapons program was dismantled, obviously a bunch of people were out of a job and either looking to retire or do whatever. Well, these scientists, nuclear weapons industry folks, uh, in order to get their pensions had to sign non-disclosure agreements, which essentially bound them to silence and perpetuity. And if they spoke, publicly, they would lose their pensions. Big incentive to stay quiet, right? Regardless of whether or not they had something to hide, 
I mean, I wouldn't talk to jeopardize my pension. Okay. Number two is that several, I think it was two or three, uh, scientists that had come out of the South African Nuclear Weapons Program were in fact implicated as part of the AQCon network. Oops. Uh, they, I, I don't remember the specific details, but I believe it was technology that they were looking to sell uh, related to the uranium enrichment technology. They used something called a, a nozzle type enrichment. It was a, um, an indigenous technology they had come up with. And so these folks were running out of money, needed to make a buck, and so got involved with the AQCon network uh, via a contact in Germany. So the point I'm trying to make is that there are some questions that still remain 20 years later. Um, while the government should be lauded for doing what they did, I think that given what has transpired since 1995, would certainly call into question, had this case come up maybe last year or the year before, the way that things were done uh, and whether or not public confidence was adequately um, bolstered in the case of South Africa and also whether the material had been adequately What is your experience on uh, the completeness and availability and accessibility of IEA records on what they made of things? Zero. What's zero? Well, it's even a little worse than that, isn't it? In terms of inspections? Or well, do we, do we know that all of their records are extant, or did, did some of it go away? Their inspection records? That's a good question. I was told by the man responsible that some of the records were destroyed. The IAEA's records? Right. Well, that's interesting. On, on what basis? Didn't want to talk about it. Oh. By the way, this is, you can't talk much about this because South Africa has control over what the IAEA can and cannot share. Yes. Mm -hmm. And they've used their veto. Yeah. So we, you know, the IAEA cannot talk to us about what it knows. That's correct. But what's interesting is what they did know, what they do know is less than what they did know because some records were destroyed. Mm -hmm. and we don't know. We don't know how that happened or how much. I think the point is that in this case there was just a lot of imprecision because the material and the documentation had been destroyed even before the IAEA got there, got there yeah. essentially. I don't know that I'd speak with a lot of certainty if I were an IAEA inspector. So that's the good news. Um, the uncertainty associated with past production for fissile material cutoff treaties, for you know, dis, dis, you know, dismantling facilities, uh, all of those things come directly into play. Can you account for it? And there are limits, not only technically, uh, by the way, you know, one interesting excursion would be, well, let's say it was 2013, how different would it be? I think it would be different too, but it would be worth knowing how different. It, and in fact, I would, I would add that not only is it a challenge to account for them, this material given all of these circumstances, but in fact, if, let's say in the future, we get down to 100 nuclear weapons or 1,000 nuclear weapons, Accounting for this kind of material becomes that much more important. Verification becomes a massive burden, not only for the nuclear weapon states, but also the non-nuclear weapon states. And I frankly think that in the case of South Africa, it might come into play again. I mean, this is a country that still has a nuclear, civilian nuclear power program. How good are their records? I, I mean, I don't know. By the but, way, they voiced a, a desire to make uh, nuclear fuel at least enrich. I mean, who knows how serious any of this I think the is. point is that, you know, if, if and when we ever get down to those really small numbers, my organization actually did a, a study about the technical challenges to accounting for uh, nuclear weapons and nuclear weapons material once you get down to the low numbers. And, and that's when this sort of thing really becomes an issue. So if we're unlucky, we don't have that problem. And if we're more lucky, we have these problems. We have these problems, right. Very good. So there's the good news. Lots of furrowed brows. <laughs> yes. You were in my day. We have some time for questions. Okay, we'll, we'll go from front to back.
what's the state of luck? I studied IR out here in the city and uh, work in the media. Thank you all for the presentation. You were fantastic. Thank you, especially so for your mention of the, um, the long span for our brows, the long and, and, uh, and sad relationship between the uh, Israeli and the South African government. There were some, some stories that older pals of mine uh, in broadcasting uh, hit me too about uh, pacification or uh, military efforts uh, uh, in South Africa that the Israelis adopted to you know, the territories. From the state to the uh, sort of unit level, what's the likelihood um, uh, of Japan uh, giving a middle finger to the uh, security umbrella and just striking out on their own very earnest uh, nuclear program? Well, and, yeah. Okay, that's a good question. And um, yeah. <laughs> and um, what's likely that the president recently got into a little bit of hot water with his remark on him remark about uh, you know, I'm more concerned about a strike in New York City and so mm -hmm. so as far as that, protocols. So for the benefit of others, then more concerned about that than what? Uh, uh, what was the rest? Uh, Ukraine. 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 Yes. 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 Right. Yes. Well, of yeah. course. Yeah. I mean, right. Yes. Yeah. Um, so could you guys uh, sort of go to the waterfront and do that and also? Well, my center has a two-year project on East Asia. And we've had the benefit of bringing Chinese, Koreans, and Japanese into the same room. And what we've done is, uh, instead of lecture, we've tried to give them something to talk about. And what we've done is we've created scenarios that are quite detailed. Charles is part of the project, but we have others, where we describe what the Japanese nuclear weapons force looks like year one, year 10, year 20, and what the Korean one does, what, what China's force looks like when it grows, and what North Korea's looks like. I mean, we're getting, we're kind of backing into our brief, because every time we get the brief, we go, oh yeah, but we forgot, what are the targets, and you know, you, you have to, it's a lot of science fiction you gotta create. But when you do this, first of all, I was told that these people will never show up. Then I was told, well, if they show up, they won't speak. And if they do speak, they won't get along. All of this has turned out not to be true. We've had about three meetings uh, at Stanford and all of them. And what they say is really interesting, and it answers your question. The Japanese and the Koreans say, well, we would never, we would never get nuclear weapons. And I said, well, would anything change that? And then they come up with a long list. Well, if this happened or this happened, well, some of the things on the list are things that are happening. You know, like, well, maybe the Russians break out of the INF treaty. Well, maybe they will. I, mean, I don't know if they will, but they, they certainly have been accused of creeping out of it. Uh, and now it isn't just the sort of hawkish right wing that says this. There are people who are on the left saying, hey, maybe this is a concern. <laughs> So, watch that box. Uh, they're thinking about it, at, at the very least, quite a lot, both the Koreans and the Japanese. I think whether they'll act, and, and, and that, that depends on a lot of other things that, that we can talk about you know, offline. You know, with regard to uh, the President's concern about New York City going up, I served on a commission on terrorism, it was a congressional commission. And the commission, before it even met, it was decided well, we were going to talk about nuclear terrorism. And that was going to be what we were going to scare the American public into recognizing they needed to worry about. And by the way, pay attention to us and the commission, because we were very important. So. Uh, luckily, someone had the wits about them to ask, yes, but do we have, have we ever received any specific intelligence that was credible about such a threat? Oh my, no. Then there was browbeating of the intelligence community. Well, why haven't you found this? You know, what's wrong with you? It's there. And of course, they had been looking. And been, I think they spent about 10% of their budget, in some cases, looking. So there's a lot. There's no evidence. But President Bush and President Obama, you do not want to be accused of not paying attention or, or, or hyping this thing for fear that it might happen. So you had your bets. But it, the idea that it's imminent, I think, is a little nutty. It's not. 
And also, it distracts very heavily from these older problems of nations getting revenues, which people don't like to talk about. Ironically, you can do more about, but it requires some friction. Whereas talking about nuclear security and nuclear terrorism is a lot of fun because it's they're non-state bad guys. Yeah, right. Who, right. We're all right. against the non-state yeah, guys. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. <laughs> so does that help? Yeah. Still, Henry, we need to we need to worry a little bit about capability as opposed to intention. Well, no, no. I, by the way, if you take care of the problem about states diverting, it helps a lot with regard to non-state non-state actors, and so it's not. I would not say. Uh, it, it's either or. You might even say the other is a lesser included uh, right. thing. But uh, you know, my fascination with the things you work on uh, has to do with national security writ large between states. But it surely applies if you care about the future. And undoubtedly, at some point, nuclear terrorism will be a problem. Right. But then you have to assume that the international institutions' oversight is sufficient to make sure the state level is able to protect against. I think you've been pretty eloquent about the, the adequacy. It's not there. If I could follow up just very swiftly. Um, so Lieberman mentioned um, uh, the people in South Africa. Do you guys have any skinny on the foreign nationals involved uh, now in uh, Iran's program? <laughs> skinny? Uh, I, think he, I think he's asking for poop. <laughs> yeah, right. It's, it's, all, good. it's all poop. Inside or outside, it's yeah. still poop. I don't have any poop. Iran right now? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I mean, certainly. Well, the Russians, obviously. Well, AQ Khan. Well, it's, it's fascinating. You know, I've you know, worked a couple of years in the State Department, a non proliferation bureau, and that actually existed. This is about 14 years ago. Back then, Bob Einhorn was then Assistant Secretary of Non proliferation. Fine man, very smart. And I remember at the time, the bureau was all up in arms. It's the Russians. You know, the Russians are, are, are you know, going to help Iran proliferate. And, and uh, you know, of course, some parts of our government knew about AQ Khan, but that hadn't hit the news yet. That was back in 2000, 2001. It wasn't until a couple years later that, oh, now it's, it's AQ Khan's fault, uh, you know, that the Iranians have this program. Well, everybody gave. Everybody gave, right? You, we have, we have uh, there's a book uh, by Scotty Rice. He's in trouble because he talked about uh, counterintelligence program that may have given American nuclear weapons design information to the Europeans. Oops. Uh, and then there's always the fear of Chinese and North, well, North Korean and collusion. I mean, the, the Iranian North there, Korean missile exchanges and then the and fear that India uh, yes. sanctioned. Uh, very embarrassing. We still, still, I think sanctions are in place with one of these I characters. India has an impeccable record, though. It has an impeccable <laughs> record. Uh, we know this don't get started on that. because some people say they don't. We sanctioned two uh, engineers, scientists, who helped, we fear, uh, Iran learn how to extract tritium from heavy water uh, production. And tritium is very important. To bomb design, now, whether they could do a boosted weapon it strikes me as pretty improbable. But anyway, so there are lots of people that could be helping yeah. Ukraine. I, I don't know, you, you name it. There was a lot of nuclear knowledge in many countries, dozens of countries. And uh, you know, I think you know Jody made that point about you have these unemployed uh, weapon scientists or you know nuclear experts, and some of them, even a small fraction, could be turned and, and help. You know, further these programs. Sir. Back when I was teaching, the most salient question that a student would ask is, will this be on the test? Yeah, they ask what the right answer is generally. Right. That's my impression as well. Yeah. Uh, I want to basically ask that question of you. What test? There's no well, quiz. it seems to me there is a test, yeah. and the test is what do we do about it. Now, oh, let me, let me, yeah. yeah. Let me finish my question before okay. you answer. Yeah. Uh, one answer could be, 
uh, it is so impossible to come up with effective monitoring of uh, industrial scale nuclear uh, energy that the only solution is to get rid of all nuclear energy. And probably each of us at some point in the past has toyed with that, and some openly, some not. But if we set aside that answer as unlikely to be implemented in our lifetimes, uh, then we get back to the question of whether it is possible to significantly affect the tolerances of uh, inspections. And if it is possible to build a more effective monitoring system without doing away with nuclear power. Now we know that the labs have worked on this for a generation at least. And if we could get hold of everything that they did in the 1970s, we would probably find that there's lots of that that has never been implemented. Uh, be careful, so, careful on that. I think that's not quite right. Well, it may turn out that you have to go back to the 80s, the well, no, no, 90s, no. I, before I, you I, get to I, the I, let, let it, I think but, Ed's been tracking that. Okay. But, but yeah. my basic question is, what has happened to the proposals for, in particular, real-time monitoring? And, uh, yeah, since I've made some of those proposals, I can tell you that once you go first. No, I, 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 I mean the, the proposals by people who could build this stuff. Yeah, well, it, it can. Why don't, why don't you let Jim Plain answer? Well, to address the first point, so you don't have to throw out the baby with the bathwater. There's a very large qualitative difference between um, direct use materials and those that require additional processing to be useful in your weapons. So if you eliminate reprocessing and, and production of direct use fuels like plutonium and uranium-233, then the delay that you have, if there's a diversion, is going to be significantly greater. So our position has always been that you don't, you don't need plutonium for nuclear power, um, that the only people who are driving it are the fanatics who have this, this faith in the infinite nuclear power system based on breeder reactors that's fallen flat. And um, and now we have the thorium people, and anyone who works in this field knows you can't go a day without hearing from one of them who say, why not build thorium molten salt reactors? Well, the uranium-233 is the byproduct of thorium irradiation that you need to keep those systems going. And so you may not want to make more uranium-233, which is a very good nuclear weapons material. But if you focus on, on low enriched uranium once through a fuel cycle, you try to improve that. Of course, there are issues with, um, with the safeguarding and the latent proliferation issues associated with enrichment. Those, uh, those have, but those can be dealt with in, in a separate track because they're the issue of diversion. Is not necessarily the, um, the, the most important issue. So now, on the issue of real-time monitoring, the problem is that if you take a plant like Rakasha, and that's probably has as close to near real-time as you can get, but you need to be able to have reduce your uncertainties in the process tanks so that if there's a fluctuation, you can tell whether that's uh, an actual diversion or just something you expect. But because the process is just not uniform, the fluctuations that occur make it very hard to, to tease out real signals from that noise. And so that's where the obstacles are. Is that there's a, uh, the only way to deal with that is to slow down the process or to shut it down so often that you couldn't operate the plant anymore. So, so there are obstacles to being able to have that idea of where everything is in the plant at any moment be able to immediately detect uh, an anomaly because of the issue of false alarms. And, um, and you can continue to work on that. And the Department of Energy has had this next generation safeguards initiative for several years. And my impression is they were trying to focus on exactly these issues, and they haven't made any progress. 
Yeah, my, in my paper, um, I had a section in there and you know, others where I bought a Defense Science Board report from about 25 years or so ago. I don't have the paper in front of me, it's in his memory, but it's a compl pretty complicated equation. And I agree with Ed, but uh, you know, each one of those terms of that equation to try to track how much plutonium is flowing through any facilities, there are certain assumptions embedded in a lot of those terms, like the reactor physics calculations. And uh, so there's, you know, each one of those terms, there's room for error. And these errors could compound. So, you know, you're, I don't think you're ever going to be able to get down to the kind of tracking I think you're, you're indicating, where we can get down to the confidence that we can track you know, within a significant quantity's worth of plutonium in, in near real time. Um, I'm very skeptical of that. I'm just, you know, ended up even citing a government report on this, showing that you know, there, um, all the things that Ed was talking about and added the assumptions embedded within um, the physics calculations you have to do, the simulations you have to do to try to understand what the flows are. Does anyone I would just add just one thing. It, obviously, the struggle between whether or not nuclear power is, is worth it anymore has certainly come up many times over the years from a proliferation perspective, from an environmental perspective. And, and in my opinion, I think the economics are going to end up superseding this entire discussion. Um, you know, the discussions about whether or not reprocessing makes sense from an economic perspective, whether this Purex. Uh, uh, technology makes any sense. So it, it seems to me from what I've been seeing in the U.S. nuclear industry, I think economics, uh, does economics kill the nuclear power <laughs> as opposed to anything else? That's got a lot of natural gas now, you know, and, and Henry in another study they're working on looking at the economics of nuclear power and it's already done. It's already done, but you, know, you can read that. I'm but. with you. I don't think economics counts. Sorry. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you why. Okay. Governments Nuclear power is the energy source for governments. It's not for people who make money. It's it's to clean up the environment. It's for national security, energy security. I mean, it's all sorts of external out externalities. It's it's promoted and subsidized. Uh, there is a paper out there called "Serious Rules for Nuclear Power Without Proliferation." If you do uh, a thought exercise, like some people have done with zero nuclear weapons, you might want to reverse the current priority, which is reflected in this communique. The current methodology for thinking about not nuclear weapons, but the civil nuclear sector is, we must have lots of nuclear power. How much non-proliferation controls can we tolerate? If you reverse it, even modestly, and say, what would the minimum amount of security require in the way of control measures uh, to have basic security, and you list that, you get quite a list. And when you share it with people, they say, oh, well, that's impractical. The, the takeaway might be, well, if that's impractical, by the way, it's not the maximum list. The maximum list, I guess, would be getting rid of it or something. If that's impractical, then maybe you shouldn't subsidize exports, or maybe you need to think about how much you're pushing this. So that's part of the answer. And the second thing is, I think as uneconomic as the power reactors are, it's very interesting that the next thing that people want to do immediately is fast reactors, which are even more uneconomical, and the reprocessing. But who's they? Uh, governments. The French government just reached an agreement with the Japanese government to work on fast reactors. Mm -hmm. The Chinese are working with the US on fast reactors. And the reason why is this perpetual motion uh, interest of exploiting all the depleted terrain. So maybe we should just agree for the moment could we put a 100 year moratorium on breeders? That would be helpful. Because I think the nuclear enterprise requires going. And with, it's kind of like, if you will, nuclear power has to keep growing or it dies and, and its stock value implodes. And so you have to have 
a discussion of how many thousand reactors you're going to have and how many breeders and closing a fuel cycle to maintain it. Because initially, you, or, or, or immediately, it, it doesn't add up. The, uh, the natural gas, uh, God knows if they make a battery that works, base load generation in general might be in trouble. Who knows? But the argument is no, clean air, energy security, close the fuel cycle. And governments are, are very comfortable. If you take a look at most of the expenditures on R&D and nuclear that is, that's being done, is being done by governments on these fast So That's technology development, right? I mean, that's, that's not well, something that will be viable. How right? shall I put it? Uh, okay. I totally disagree, Henry. Yes. I well, will keep arguing with you. I, I how shall I put it? The, the light water reactor wouldn't have been created without that R&D effort. Well, R&D, absolutely. Yeah. Well, but that it, doesn't it, mean they're going to get bills or commercialized. Uh, you're right, and maybe not. You're right. I mean, how shall I put it? We've had fast reactors built or attempted to be built in almost every major nuclear power state. Attempted to be built. Well, or built. Russians built. Yeah, whatever. I think. The point here is that economics will do a certain amount. Knowing what the problem is might get people to wake up and stop throwing kerosene on the fire by pushing these things in places like Saudi Arabia, for God's sakes. Uh, and I think you need to actually throttle back on enthusiasms of certain technical fanatics who want to close the fuel cycle within the next 15 years. Because if you listen to the Chinese, that's their point. And to a lesser extent, the Koreans and the Japanese. We're done. Well, we have one last question. That's so uh, I'm just curious, uh, Dave Kramer of Physics Today. If there's thousands of weapons worth of material that's gone missing, why has no one used uh, built a weapon and used it yet? Say again. Who's got this material? Well, well they may have. I mean, if, if, if Victor Galinsky and Roger Matson are correct, and, and I also refer to in my paper the New Met case, going back to the 1960s, you know, up to 300 kilograms of HU could have made its way to Israel. Right. And then last time we, we spoke as a panel a couple of months ago in Capitol Hill. Henry raised a very interesting scenario, I think Victor Galinsky brought it up, is that that material may not have been directly used to make Israeli nuclear bombs, but it could have fueled the Israeli plutonium production reactor to make even more fissile material for dozens of nuclear bombs. A, they call it a driver. Yes. You put the hue in the so it's you know we, we can't we don't have definitive evidence that that's what happened but there's so much circumstantial evidence pointing in that direction. Is there any other uh, uh, any other case like that? Well, the good news is you don't have to worry about it. <laughs> it didn't know, but some of us are still interested not just in the past, but the future. I understand that. Yeah, what's the past? Of life? What we're learning from the past is that we need to be more candid about these problems if we're to have a bright future and we hide the ball with nuclear security communiques and any number of other things. So maybe if we can get the problem and the question right, we can do a lot better. That's what this panel is about. I understand. I just right. right. It's a good question. Right. Yeah, if there are any other stories out there we can talk I, I think the short answer is no. You shouldn't take solace in that. Folks, you've been very good. Thank you.